Okay. So we, we are back to semiconductors. That's where we started. And then we went through all the band structures, uh, basically Bravia lattice, reciprocal lattice, X-ray scattering, uh, band structures. And then we talk about phonons. And now we're back to semiconductors. And semiconductors are basically made of elements that are mainly, usually, uh, group four, carbon, silicon, germanium, tin, lead, but then we have here, nitrogen, phosphorus, arsenic, antimony, bismuth, and then we have um, boron, aluminum, gallium, indium, thallium, and then we have zinc, cadmium, mercury, and then we have oxygen, sulfur, selenium, tellurium, and polonium. So, as we learn, group four semiconductor is quite simple. It's all, basically, it's made of carbon, or silicon, or uh, germanium, and so on. Okay? We can also mix group four semiconductors, such as silicon and germanium in whatever the way we want. Okay? So we can mix silicon and germanium, and then if they form a diamond lattice, it's a, it's a, it's a semiconductor, because they use up all the uh, four valence electrons around each atom. Okay? There's also silicon carbide. You've heard, you've heard of silicon carbide. Silicon carbide is a you know, one-to-one -one structure of silicon and car carbon. Okay, that's also uh, semiconductors. There are three, five semiconductors, as I introduced to you. Three, five semiconductors, such as gallium nitride, gallium arsenide. Uh, then we can mix a lot of different things, gallium, one minus X, aluminum X, arsenide. This is one, basically, right? So we can mix, oh sorry, this is aluminum. We can mix different things, gallium and aluminum and arsenic. As long as it's three, five, three, five is in one to one ratio one-to-one -one ratio. Then we have two sixes. Two sixes, which is zinc selenide, mercury telluride, um, what else? Yeah, um, why am I missing copper? Copper is here. Copper, I think, is here. And then my feeling is that you've heard of other semiconductors such as indium, copper, selenide. Have you heard of this? Indium, copper, selenide. Indium is three, copper is two. Does that make sense? 
So average is two, and selenide is six. So I guess it's okay. <laughs> so this is this is one, three, six semiconductors. This is group 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 one. This is group three, and this is group six. Okay, but still, as long as this is one to one. They use up their bonds. Okay, and I think they use something like this for for solar cells these days. Solar cells. So now I'm going to talk about the band structure. We have already discussed difference in band structure. Here's a case base. Uh, more, to be more precise, to be more precise, this is zero. This is uh, this is at gamma point. This is towards x, and this is towards l in a in a in a in a reciprocal lattice, reciprocal space, and you can do something like this. Now you have an idea of what I'm drawing. I have three, of course, we have somewhere here. One is like states. This is one is like state. This is three, three, uh, three of two P like states, right? This is two P like states. This is one is like. And probably one is two P, so this is one. This is 2s-like state, right? 2s-like state. And you know that for semiconductors, we have electron filling this band completely, filling this band completely, filling this band completely, and filling this band completely. Then. Then I run out of valence electrons. Remember, we have, uh, for the case of diamond lattice, we have silicon, silicon, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Because we have to think two silicon in a base, there are two silicon atoms in basis, we have eight electrons to distribute, right? And then, Two goes here, two goes here, two goes here, two goes here, so one, two, four, six, eight, and we ran out of electrons. Now we have energy gap between here. Here's the energy gap. This is energy gap. This is energy gap. Okay? So, um, this is also something I told you before. If I break one of the bonds, one of the bonds, I make, I have to give energy to break the bonds or take this electron away from the bonds. And then once we do that, we have one empty hole. And then we have one freely moving electron. That is depicted here. If this is the energy required to break bonds, so breaking bonds to make the one electron free is equivalent to sending electron, one electron from here to there. 
right? Because uh, it, we gave energy to bring this electron to higher energy states. And then we make this electron movable because now we have more states available above electron so that electron can move around. Okay? And then we have one empty state, which is whole, which is whole. Okay? Now, this is the case for direct, direct gap semiconductors. This is the case with direct gap semiconductors. That means the position of the valence band, valence band, this is, a, this is called valence band top, maximum, this is a, ba this is a valence band maximum, right? Highest point. And this is a, this is a conduction band, band minimum, right? They agree within the case space. So in this case, remember when electron goes back to here, the energy is gained and such extra energy can be emitted as photon, as a light. Because if the valence band top is, conduction band minimum is right above the valence band top. So if there's a direct gap. So when an electron falls back, energy can be emitted as a photon. And photon has energy H, C over lambda. So the band gap, the energy band energy gap, or strength of bond, bonding strength, determines the color of the light coming out of the semiconductors. So this is a case, in fact, for this is for direct band to semiconductors. Story is different from indirect band gap semiconductors. So if they if this is indirect, we have different here's like a this is like X, this is L. This is gamma. So, <clears throat> this is now the the, val uh, the conduction band minimum is here. So when we break electron bond of silicon, of course we make one hole and one electron. But that goes to one hole here and one electron here. So this is indirect, so they are shifted. And when they are shifted, for, for electron to go from here to here, or for electron, for for the for the electron to go from here to there, it has to conserve the energy but also but also um, it has to conserve the energy.
but also this quantity here. This quantity here, which is basically k delta k, or delta k, or what's the what's the right right um, let's say, let's just say k prime k prime corresponding to the length here, okay? And of course. K prime h bar is momentum, momentum this is not legible, momentum it's a momentum so that we have to conserve, conserve both the energy and the momentum for this case. So when electron in silicon, when an electron in silicon goes back to the hole, when this goes back to the hole, that means electron goes back to here, it emits energy, but also the momentum. And unfortunately, light carries almost zero momentum, very small momentum. Okay? So light alone cannot, light can conserve, participate to con conserve the energy, but not the momentum, because light is not carrying the momentum. Very little, little bit, but not so much. Okay? So when this electron goes back to here, when this electron goes back to here, energy and momentum gain has to be consumed by something, and that is consumed by lattice vibration, phonons. Okay? Because Silicon is silicon atom has a mass. So when silicon atom vibrate, it you know it can consume energy as well as momentum and mv mass times velocity. Okay, mv. So this is why when electron goes back to hole for the case of silicon or for the case of for the case of indirect semiconductors indirect gap semiconductors semiconductors light light doesn't come out light doesn't come out but just, you know, recombination leads to just induce induction of the, of the phonon or lattice vibrations. So this is why, unfortunately, it is difficult to make light emitting diode from silicon. Okay? So even though all the electronics, almost all the electronics are made of silicon semiconductors, the the you know light emitting diode is not made of semi, uh, silicon. Now that's you know if you can make silicon um, shine very brightly, then you 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 become very rich. <laughs> yeah. If, okay. You can see how important it is now with all these illuminations. Right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so let me move on to other next part. So that's the... Uh, that's the basic difference between direct and indirect semiconductors. 
Now we go back to density of states. Density of states. You may recall that we have talked about density of states a while ago. Now, if I draw density of states, I'm going to say this is G density of states for conduction band as a function of energy, and this is a density of states of valence band as a function of energy, and this is energy, and this is EC, this is EV. What is EV and this is, what is EC? This is, this is this. This is position of this. Right? The valence band top is EV, Conduction band minimum is EC. Okay? Now I'm going to say G's density of states for electron is this. This is simply E minus EC one half. Remember? Energy. Uh, square root of energy. We had, we, you've seen this before. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, so many, I wouldn't say hours ago, so many months ago, days ago, whatever. Okay? Okay. Now I can also draw this is a tricky part now. I can also draw density of states for valence, valence band. Density of states for valence band. And what is density of states for valence band? It goes like this. So this is um, EV minus E to the one half proportional to. So I have to make one thing clear to you. Energy, this energy going up is for electron. And energy is higher this way for holes. Because if the electron is higher this way, then its energy is higher for holes in this direction. In other words, remember I said electron is filled. And I say I give energy to send one electron from here to here. So I gave this much energy to send one electron from here to here. But I can also say that, well, I need to give energy, I need to give energy to send one hole, because there's no electrons, so they are holes. One hole from here to here, because for holes, energy is higher in this direction, right? So I can say, I send one hole from here to here by giving energy EG. Then here it's a plus, because I send, these, these are all empty, so these are all holes. I send one hole from here to there, right? So this is a, this is basically a density of state. So hole, for hole, energy is higher in this direction. For electron, energy is higher in this direction. And re rest of the discussion is very similar to what we had. Remember we had effective mass. When we calculated effective mass, 
we have something like this. We somewhere here, there's a there's a change of the slope or curvature. I must say curvature, right? Remember, double derivative of the band is the effective mass, and somewhere this part is electron. No, I'm using yellow. I'm using red for electron. So. This part, this part is electron, electron. I'm, I'm, you know, take, I'm, I'm drawing one of the bands. And this part is a hole, right? And a hole goes like this, and an electron comes back like this. So, so this region is really whole. This region is whole. That's a whole. Then I can talk about density of states for holes. Holes. So this is density of states. Density. Density of states for holes. And that's energy to square, not square, the uh, one half, energy to one half. Hole is just as very, very, hole is just very similar to electrons. Then, then we want to, then we want to draw, let's see, um, then we want to draw, we want to draw Fermi statistics. This is zero and this is one. Fermi level is somewhere in the middle. Remember, in a in a in a in, in an intuitive way, intuitive way, I, I shouldn't have drawn I shouldn't have erased the thing. But here's the valence band. Here's a conduction band. I told you that electro ele oh, electrons are filled all the way up here, and electrons are empty, no electrons here. So here you find probability of electron, oh, okay. Here, the prob probability of finding electron is one here, at this energy. At this state, probability of finding an electron is zero. And what is the, what is the, what is the uh, definition of, of the, of the uh, Fermi level? Place where energy where the probability of finding electron is one half. This is one, this is zero, so one half has to be somewhere in the middle, center. Right? Center. So that means I have Fermi level by extending this all the way here. Here's the Fermi level. So I, I should have something like this. Right? This is 
This is a frame level. So this is a frame level. Okay, one half. So finally, I can actually try to draw concentration of electrons. Concentration of electron. So now I can draw concentration of electron. So that maybe I should, I, I, I should have told you that I will be extending this figure to the right. I, can, I see some of you are just running out of space on the right. <laughs> but here I have EC. Here I have EV. And now I have here a concentration of electron, which is function of energy. And here I have concentration of holes as a function of energy. This is whole concentration. This is electron concentration. Now, now, how do I find the electron and hole concentration? Of course, you find electron concentration by multiplying this density state times probability of finding electron. Right? So, you have, you have something like Fermi level going like this. Right? And density states going up, going up like this. So this times this is something like this. Let's make it straight. So concentration of electrons, it goes like this. This is a concentration of electron. Do you understand what I mean? This is a concentration of electron. And this uh, concent concentration of holes, concentration of holes. This is yellow, yeah, this, uh, I should have written by red. I'm just confusing red and yellow. <laughs> this is a this is Fermi distribution find function, which means probability of finding electrons. Then what is, the, what is the probability of finding holes? What is the probability of finding holes? Probability of finding holes is the probability of not finding electrons. Right? Probability of finding holes is probability of not finding electrons. So that's this. That's, that's 1 minus Fe. Probability finding holes. Okay? So now,
I'm going to draw I'm going to draw whole concentration as this this times this right whole concentration is whole density states times probability of finding holes and again this is something like this yeah So now, then, um, yeah, then maybe I move on to the next part, which is, um, Let me see. Um, okay. So I will move on. At the end of today's lecture, I will come back to the effectiveness of electron and holes, okay? And that's going to be the uh, concluding part of this, this lecture. But um, before I do this, yeah. Let me move on with still something related to this. I'm going to use this part of the board, okay? So now um, we want to find how electron concentration and hole concentration depends on the temperature, okay? Right now, I didn't draw something. I, 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 I'm drawing a Fermi function like this, assuming that, assuming that it's a high temperature, or it's a high finite temperature. In other words, it's not a zero temperature, okay? So we want to find the temperature dependence. And let me introduce a new term called intrinsic semiconductors. Intrinsic semiconductors. So intrinsic semiconductors is a semiconductor without any impurities. So it's an intrinsic, it's a pure, pure material. Silicon without any impurities. Okay? For this case, Concentration of electron is same as concentration of holes. Do you agree? Because I take one electron away from the bond, then I make one hole. So by definition, the number of electrons, movable electrons, and number of holes, movable holes, must be equal. Okay? Must be equal because one, I take one electron away from silicon bond to make it free, but then I make also one hole, uh, one, I make one hole free to move. And this is N equals to P is called, is defined as N sub I, and this is, 
This is known as intrinsic intrinsic carrier concentration. Intrinsic carrier concentration. So we want to find out how intrinsic carrier concentration depends on temperature. Basically, so question is how Ni depends depends on T temperature? That's a question. And if I, for the time being, say Fermi level is intrinsic set Fermi level. So for the time being, I define EF as a, you know, same as a intrinsic Fermi level, E sub I. Okay? Then I get Ni, intrinsic carry concentration equals to N. And C exponential E I over E conduction band over Boltzmann constant and K T. And same is true for holes and the exponential EV minus EI KT. So what is NC and NV? What is NC and V? NC is Yeah, I have to I have to tell you what NC and V are. So let me let me let me let me uh, go back a little bit here and is given by basically EC and is given by EC to infinity um, G C E F E D E and P is given by um, EV to minus infinity, G, V, E, 1 minus F, E, D, E. Okay? Then I'm going to introduce a new term called when EC minus EF is much larger than 3KT when, I should say when, I can, I can approximate N equals to NC exponential EF minus EC KT and when EC EF minus EV is also much larger than 3KT 
then P is NV exponential EV minus EF KT. This is so-called Boltzmann approximation. Okay. After all, the, the idea, idea is quite simple. Idea is quite simple. After all, remember, this distribution looks simply exponential if it's far, far away from, far away from, if this is far away from Fermi level. Around Fermi level, it's not exponential, but here, it's ex like, like, like here, it looks exponential, right? Far away from Fermi level. Far away from Fermi level, it lo all looks exponential here, like here, right? So er if the energy is far away from the Fermi level, you can always approximate the, approximate the uh, uh, you know, some exponential uh, Fermi, Fermi function. For Fermi functions, it's exponential, okay? So that's why there, this is a Fermi function part. This is a Fermi fun exponential part. And then NC and V is an effective, NC and V is an effective density of states. Effective effective density of states. Effective density of states. And then effective density of states are NC, conduction band effective density states is given by two, uh, two pi, effect, effective mass of electron, KT, over H square, three half. NV is two, two pi M effective mass of whole KT H square three half. Okay. So this is this is where these equations came from. Come from. So um, with the top equation, I get N C equals to N I exponential. EC minus EI KT and from the bottom equation NV equals to NI exponential EI minus EV KT okay Can I, is it okay to erase this part? Then, 
So from these, I get n equals to ni e, um, ec minus ei kt times E E F minus E C K T equals to N I ex exponential E F minus E I over K T. And same is for P, for whole concentration, N I E E I minus E V over K T exponential E V minus E F over K T is equals is equal to n i e e i minus e f over k t and so we're getting close to the conclusion results n times p equals to this times this this times this is, what is it? Is ni square, of course. If I do this, this time this, it's trivial. Sorry, uh, let me wait a little bit. Uh, this is too trivial, so let me do something else. Where can I find something more useful? This times this is, oh yeah, it's NC. Unfortunately, I have already erased, but NC times NV times exponential EV minus EC over KT. Does it make sense? Right? Does it make sense? Uh, equals to NC, NV, exponential, this is energy gap, minus energy gap, over KT, and this is equals to NI squared, NI squared. So at the end, we get main results, Ni equals to square root of Nc, Nv, exponential minus Eg over 2kt, over 2kt. So if I just take natural log of both sides, if I take a natural log of both sides, log ni equals to log nc nv plus minus eg over 2k 1 over t. So,
what you get is the following. You take natural log of n versus 1 over t. Then you expect to get something straight line. And the slope, this is a slope. This is a slope. Slope, slope is minus eg over 2k. Proportional to. Slope is proportional to minus eg over 2k. So have you heard of the method called Hall effect? Hall effect. You measure car carrier concentrations. You, ba you basically measure this M, right, carrier concentration, okay? Um, then if you measure carrier, carrier concentration as a function of the temperature of semiconductors, if you measure semiconductors, intrinsic semiconductors, you get something in straight line when you, if you plot your results like this. Then from the slope, you get, you, you, find, you find energy gap. Okay? So now I move on to the uh, uh, extrinsic semiconductors. Extrinsic semiconductors. Extrinsic semiconductors. So we have already seen that um, phosphorus in silicon is called donor because it's, it's, it's phosphorus is a donor because phosphorus is one right next to silicon. It has one extra electron, so that. At low temperature, it binds one electron, one extra electron, and then at high temperature, this bond breaks, and then phosphorus has positive. Phosphorus is positively charged. Phosphorus is positively charged. A similar thing happened for for boron. Boron in the case of boron, boron is a is called is called acceptor. Boron is called acceptor. Uh, it has one, it is right one next to silicon, left one left to silicon, so it has one less uh, outer electron, therefore um, it has one empty hole bound to it, okay? So I'm now going to say the concept of Bohr radius Yes. So this is this picture is very similar to hydrogen. It has one positive nuclei or nucleus, and then it has one electron bound to it. And the binding force is a, is a Coulombic energy, Coulombic attractive force, right? So we can treat this as if it is a hydrogen atom. If we treat this as if, as if it's a hydrogen atom, then uh, angular momentum, angular momentum, 
angular momentum becomes equal to, basically the idea is that we have positive and we have one electron bound to it and it's going around, circle. Right? So angular momentum and the distance here, distance here is Rn, Rn, R sub n. Angular momentum is given by effective mass of electron, velocity, and radius. Mass times velocity, if this is going velocity v, mass times velocity times radius. And I, we call this Bohr model because Bohr, Niels Bohr, uh, Danish, uh, famous uh, physicist from Denmark, said, this is quantized, so this is n h bar for the case of hydrogen. n is just an integer, one, two, three, four, five. Let's just say this is equation one. And in an SI unit, we get mv squared, Rn equals to Q squared, 4 pi, epsilon, epsilon 0, Rn squared. So what I am doing is that, what I am doing here is that, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, of course, make two parts equal. This part is the Coulombic atrambic, uh, attractive force. Q, one Q comes from positive Q, the other Q comes from negative Q, and they attract to, to, to put, you know, keep them together. But then, if there's attractive force, there has to be some force going the other way so that electron keeps the same radius. The other way it is basically, this is basically given by this angular momentum. It's going this way, so it's basically trying somehow, vector-wise, trying to go out, okay? So that's, the, that's this left term, okay? So by making, Tr trying to go out force and right hand size trying to attract force together equal then electron goes around in the same circle. Okay? It's a simple model but surprisingly it works very well. So from one and two we get Rn equals to 4 pi epsilon, epsilon 0, n h square, m square, charge square. Okay? And by the way, uh, when n equals one, R one is called Bohr radius. Now, finally, I suddenly I realized that this is a this should be Bohr, Bohr model. 
<laughs> you may wonder why I call it all of a sudden radius. It's a Bohr model. And now here's the Bohr radius. Right? And you'll find that this is this depends radius depends on mass mass of the electron mass of the electron and then epsilon is just a it's just a dielectric constant but dielectric constant between germain other different semiconductors isn't so different by the way this is the permittivity of the free space. Um, for silicon, for okay, for silicon, Bohr radius is R one is around three nanometer. Germanium R one Bohr radius is about eight nanometer. For gallium arsenide, R one is equal to twelve nanometer. And then, now, um, we consider EK, kinet kinetic, kinetic energy of electron is EK equals to one over one half m effective mass velocity square is one half two square um, four pi epsilon epsilon zero r n Potential energy. Potential energy of electron is U equals to minus Q square four pi epsilon. Remember, the potential energy is just a, you know, because there's a positive, positive nucleus, um, there's the, the pulling, pulling, pulling energy is like this, right? Electron gets closer to the, to the plus, it gets pulled, uh, pulled in more. So it's just a columbic potential energy. Okay? And this kinetic energy is just a kinetic energy of the moving electron. So the total energy, the total energy is given by total energy is given by En total energy. En equals to Ek plus U and that's minus one half Q square four pi epsilon epsilon zero R N
then we put this into this equation or the other way around the other way around I can say we, I put this Rn into this to, to eliminate Rn if I substitute this part into Rn here I can, sub, I can erase Rn and then I end up getting En equals to minus m star q to the 4 2 4 pi epsilon epsilon 0 n h bar to the square which is 13.6 electron volt or I should I shouldn't write that here 13.6 over epsilon square uh, electron volt So what does it mean? You've seen 13.6 electron volt before from hydrogen in a, in, a, in a free space. Hydrogen in vacuum. So after all, you see this part, this part, M naught remains, but all the other part just is it's just borrow, is borrowed or borrowed from hydrogen in vacuum. So just an you know, equation for hydrogen vacuum. So 13.6 electron volts is, what is it? This is, a, this is a ionization energy of the, of the hydrogen and in, hydrogen in vacuum. If I have hydrogen, if I have hydrogen with electron in vacuum, it takes 13.66 electron volts to take away electron to take an electron away from hydrogen. That's the ionization of the energy of hydrogen. Epsilon square is just a, this is just a, a dielectric constant of the semiconductors. M M naught is a is a is an electron mass in free space. Ele electron rest mass. This is an electron rest mass. 9.1 times 10 to the minus 8 kilogram, right? Nine point eight times ten to the minus eight kilogram. So all I'm saying is that, after all, this is like hydrogen, hydrogen in, in, in vacuum, but with different mass and different dielectric constant. Typically, epsilon of semiconductor is around ten, and mass is typically smaller than M naught, electron mass, rest mass. Usually, uh, you know, like 0.1 to 0.4 M naught. Sorry, there's one thing missing. N square. <laughs> I forgot to put N square. Right? N square. Yeah? N square. Okay? So now, So typically, En for a semiconductor is smaller than 0 0.1 electron volts or less than 100 milli electron volts. 
ओके सो द इम्प्यूरिटी दैट फॉलो दैट इम्प्यूरिटीज दैट फॉलो बोर्स मॉडल इज इज कॉल्ड शैलो इम्प्यूरिटीज शैलो इम्प्यूरिटीज Why is shallow? It's shallow because if you know there's a conduction band, and electrons are freely moving in a conduction band, and then where there is phosphorus or where there's arsenic, it it has a potential to trap electron, but the potential is so you saw that so small. It's only What is it? Like a like a zero point zero five electron volts, whereas energy gap is one point one electron volts. So for electron to go back to form bond, you gain lots of energy. But for this to get trapped by this shallow trap is difficult. At least in room temperature, this is why we call it. This is shallow impurities. There is also deep impurities, which has deep trap. So once electron is trapped, it is difficult for electron to go back. Okay, and you know, trap we always call it. You know, right some states inside. So there's a there's an electron trap, and there's electron emission. Okay. So now I go back to the band diagram of, of silicon. So here's a here's a here's a here's a here's a valence band, and this is conduction band of silicon. For the case of silicon, where 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 is the where is the position of the shallow level in this K versus energy diagram? This is a this this horizontal axis is a real real position. This is a direct lattice. This is a reciprocal space. Where should I put? Where is phosphorus level? Is shallow level? Where is a shallow level? That's a question. Where is shallow level? And the answer is here. Just, for example, about donor ionization energy away, which is about, for the case of silicon, it's about 0.05 electron volts or 50 milli electron volts. So electron can go back and forth between here because the electron is moving here, right? Electron is mo moving. Electrons are here, and they get trapped by the shallow level. Or electron is provided from the shallow level to the to the to the to the conduction band. Shallow acceptor is here. Shallow acceptor is here. 
acceptor. Ea. That's acceptor, shallow acceptor. Level. Level. Okay, so this is shallow acceptor level. Why did I draw this so narrow? In other words, why didn't I draw this like this? Big. What is it? Yeah. Correct. That's a, that's a, that's due to the. Uh, that's really due to the, uh, that's due to the, basically the uncertainty principle. You're saying the same thing. In other words, in a, in a real space, shallow level is confined in certain radius. And uh, basically, there's a, there's a, there's a delta P, Delta X, delta P de delta X is probably around H, right? You've, you know, Pauli said, momentum and position cannot be determined exactly at the same time. Okay, yeah? And momentum is this, this is delta H bar, K, delta X equals H, right? So this means delta K, delta X should be of the order of, you know, this is H bar and this is H, so this should be order of two pi, something like that, right? So in the case of shallow impurities, Shallow impurity is confined within the radius of Rn, right? So roughly speaking, roughly speaking, this diameter corresponds to delta x because, you know, somewhere here, you find an electron. Somewhere here, you find an electron, right? Electrons going around the radius Rn. So somewhere here, you find an electron. Okay? This is shallow impurity. Shallow level. What about so-called deep level? Deep, deep level. This one, deep level. What about deep level? What about the deep level? Deep level. Electron is confined, or something, into impurity very strongly for the deep level, right? Because, you know, it's deep because it, it, it catches electrons so strongly. It doesn't want to give away electrons so easily. So that means usually confinement delta x 
is much smaller. Right? Much smaller for deep level. This means, this means deep level can be extended much larger. It's deep and therefore there's more bigger uncertainty in delta K. Right? Delta X is small, so because of this relation, delta K becomes large for the deep level. Okay, so this is deep level, we draw this large. Make sense? So sometimes, so sometimes we introduce, sometimes we introduce this deep level intentionally because electron here can get trapped here very easily. Then electron moves around, changes momentum. When the electron moves here, it can recombine here with holes very easily. So you can make a path for the electron to go back. Well, I will come back to that a uh, little later. Okay, and then I will come back to that a little later. But then I will have to talk about, I will have to talk about uh, Fermi level, position of the Fermi level, okay, of the intrinsic semiconductors. So now you know difference between shallow level and deep levels. Now we move on. to the description of a Fermi level. Fermi level. Okay? Intrinsic semiconductors. Intrinsic semiconductors. N equals to P. And that is, as, as we saw, NV, E, EF, minus EC over KT equals to, um, sorry, this is NC, this is NC, NV um, exponential EV minus EF KT, and we put, again, we uh, set Set EI equals to 
EF, then we get EI equals EC plus EV over 2 plus KT to natural log NV and C. And that's equal to EC minus EV plus EV two plus So after all, after all, um, the EI or family level depends on the ratio of whole effective mass and electron effective mass. And you get the idea why. This is actually simply because Remember we had I forgot which one. This is this is E minus E C one half and this is uh, E V minus E um, one half. Right? But that doesn't mean everything. Sometimes maybe this is bigger. Sometimes this is smaller, right? Right? And how big or how small depends on the mass. So in, a, in an extreme case, if this is like this, if this is like this, and if this is like this, right? You take one electron, uh, one hole from balance band to, you excite one electron from balance band. So we send one empty spot here and one occupied spot here. We make the other one open, but then we, make, we put another one. We make the other, we send one, another electron empty. Then we send this one here. But then you see that here, you get more energy than this energy, the spacing. That means because density of states is denser here, even though we, we take, there are only three holes and three electrons, we have more levels energy-wise. A higher level is occupied here than this difference here. Okay? If this is the case, if this is the case, Fermi level, Fermi level is not exactly at the center. Even though people, I, we assume that Fermi level is exactly at the center because we have probability of electron finding one here and zero here, so middle is one half. Now we have three missing and three electrons here, but this is extended higher. So that naturally, the Fermi level position goes up. You have probability of finding electron higher in energy, right? So this is why the Fermi level of the intrinsic semiconductor depends on masses, mass ratio. And that's only because of this, you know, how much energy we, they, 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 uh, they occupy. So that's, uh, that's basically um, intuitive description 
of where the frame level is. Okay. Now, extrinsic semiconductors. Extrinsic semiconductors. Let's just assume that, let's just for the time you assume, let's just assume that thermal energy is much larger than ED or EA. Remember ED, EA is a donor ionization or acceptor ionization energy. Energy requires to ionize donor or acceptor. Take electron away from the impurity. And then we have, oh, this, is a, this is an extreme approximation. But N is ND. And P, whole concentration is NA. Then EF minus EI. This is EI, sorry. Oh yeah, this is EI. Is Then, assuming this relation, we get EF KT LN ND and I. And EF EF But you know, this is just show you how the Fermi level cha position changes with the temperature. But I, I guess I, I give you, rather than equation, I give you more intuitive picture, okay? Let's say we have, in a real space, now this is a real space. We have conduction band and valence band, and we have lots of, we have lots of donors. Right? At low temperature, at low temperature, they, these levels are occupied by electrons. Each phosphorus has one electron. Now where is the Fermi level? Conduction band is filled. You find, this, so here's a, Here's a probability of finding electron one here. Also probability of finding electron one here. Probability of finding electron zero here. Right? So prob probability of finding electron zero. This is zero. 
Fe0 here is Fe equals 1, right, this level. So the Fermi level must be right in between. This has to be EF, right? This must be EF. Do you agree? This level, you find probability of finding electrons 1. This level, 0. So probability of finding electron 1 half is somewhere here, OK? At low temperature. You raise temperature. Some of the electrons are, are stripped away from the from from a shallow level, so they are now in the conduction band. They are now in the conduction band. They are now in the conduction band. And they are moving. Now the story is much more complicated. Where exactly is probably defining electron one half? Here's one, here's, but it's, it's somewhere here. <laughs> so the Fermi level always stays somewhere here, around donor level. That's why we say Fermi level is always somewhere around donor level. However, if we raise temperature even farther, what happens is that if we raise temperature farther, we start to send more electrons from here to here. Right? Basically breaking silicon bonds. The even higher temperature actually breaks more bonds. And eventually, this electron number of electrons overwhelms the number of electrons coming from donors. Right? Overwhelms meaning that you get more electron and conduction band coming from the valence band. And then this is like intrinsic semiconductors. Now it doesn't matter whether we have impurities or not. So now Fermi level is, in this case, is somewhere in between, somewhere here. So to summarize, Fermi level is close to the donor level, ED. Close to the donor level to begin with. But then as we raise the temperature higher and higher, we get more excitation from valence band to the conduction band. And that will make this whole semiconductor more intrinsic. And eventually when intrinsic uh, the electron coming from valence band overwhelms the number of electron coming from the uh, impurities, then Fermi level comes to the center. Okay? So if I plot, if I plot, The, as a function of the temperature, the position of the Fermi level. Here's EC, here's ED, here's EV. As a function of the temperature, it goes somewhere like this. Something like that. Right? In fact, it, it, is, it is very, very stable here. I should probably like this. Okay? Let's say this is about 300 Kelvin. Roughly speaking, room temperature.
So now, I come back to the description of I come back to the description of the I hope now you know what I'm drawing. Now the Fermi level is close to the conduction band. Here's the Fermi level. This is conduction band. Right? Consequently, we have we have we have more we have much more electron than holes in n-type semiconductors. The only difference from the, the previous diagram is that you see the Fermi level, what it, in an intrinsic semiconductor, Fermi level was at the center. Here, center between EV, here's the EV valence band, at the center. Now it's because it's an n-type, because it has shallow impurities, it is moved to donor level. So it's just a Fermi level is shifted. Then, as a result, we have more electrons. We have more electrons than holes. We have more electrons than holes. The story is the same. This, this part is the same. This uh, story is the same for p-type semiconductors. And what is really interesting, at least to me, is that what is really interesting, at least for me, is that remember, you see, n-type semiconductors 
in, my, in, in the very first lecture, I, told, I, I introduced semiconductors. I said, in n-type semiconductors, you get electrons from donors. N-type semiconductors. We put impurities. So we get electrons. P-type semiconductors, we said impurities like group three impurities. P-type semiconductors, group three impurities. So we get holes. So in my first lecture, I said, as if N-type semiconductor, you only have electrons. And P-type semiconductors, as if we have only holes. But the fact is that we have both, in both N-type and P-type semiconductors. We always get both electron and holes. Even in n-type semiconductors, there's always holes. And this relation is given by ni square equals np. This is always true for any semiconductors. So unless you make carrier concentration, for example, unless you make electron concentration infinity, you will never make hole concentration zero. And what, why, why is the case? It, 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 it all because of this Fermi function. Fermi function is expon exponential and they never go to zero. So they, they just shift position, but the tail is always there. Even for, for example, here. You see, it's very little, but tail is always there. So that's why you get a little bit of the electron concentration. Okay? So now you get um, well now you do get much better understanding of LEDs. But before moving on to LEDs, I just have to cover one more thing. Oh semiconductors. And I will intentionally skip, I will intentionally skip the difficult part. I will skip, skip description of indirect semiconductors. This you can actually, I mean, if needed, you can, you can study by yourself. Uh, so here I, I draw an uh, energy diagram for direct semiconductors. Direct meaning that at gamma zero, at gamma point, it has a direct transition. Okay? And then <coughs> uh, for electron effective mass, the story, because it's effective, it's a, it's a direct semiconductor, the, the story is quite simple. It's a, one of those things. Uh, we have at the center is, a, is the gamma point, remember? Center is a gamma point in a brilliant zone. Gamma, zone, gamma point. And we have We have spherical constant energy surface. We did this many days ago. We study constant energy surface, right? In, in KY, K, KY, KX, KZ. Constant energy surface. So, 
In this case, E minus EC is H bar KX square plus KY square plus KZ square over 2M E. And basically from this, basically just from, basically from the curvature here, curvature here, you, curvature here, you can find the effective mass. Okay? As simple as that. The story becomes much more complicated for indirect semiconductors, for example. For silicon, for silicon, it got the, this part becomes the lowest uh, conduction band. Then, you know, this is one zero zero direction. So you have, we have one, two, three, four, five, six equivalent uh, one zero zero direction. So six, six minima in a K space story becomes quite complicated. So you worry about this only when you work on silicon, not now, okay? But I just want to also touch on this balance map. You notice that there are two bands touching or overlapping here at the top of the valence band, at the top of the valence band, and then we have to treat them somehow, right? How do we figure out the effective mass of whole? Effective mass, you know, I say, okay, curvature is important, but there are two curvatures. So what do we do? is a question. What do we do? So now it's a hole. Effective mass for hole. Effective mass for hole is simply we talk about, let's just, let's just talk about the density of states for valence band. After all, density of states is what matters. So, square root of two, m whole three half e v minus e one half by third. Right? This is, you've seen this before. This is just a dense, you know, a equation for density of states. Not the effective density of states, but you know, original density of states. And this is, becomes longer. This is square root of two, m h h three half e v minus e one half pi third, h bar third, plus square root of two, LH three half, EV minus E one half, pi third, h bar third. Now I have two effective mass, heavy hole, and light hole. What, 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 what do I mean by that? This is, this is heavy hole. Heavy hole band. Curvature is large. Then, curvature is larger than this. Light hole band. Right? Because light hole band is curvature is large, this is lighter, the mass is lighter for red band, large curvature. Mass is heavier for the heavy blue band, okay? Why am I adding two things here? Why am I adding two things? This is the same thing as 
as if I'm saying, okay, let's just plot GV as a function of the energy, energy for holes. We have heavy hole density of states, and we have light hole density of states. I, I, I don't know which is larger, but you know, all I'm saying is that there's a, probably heavy hole is larger because it's, it's, it's slower. So heavy hole density of states and light hole density of states, right? Then total density of states is just an addition of the two, sum of the two, total number of states. Why do, I, why do I put larger density of states for blue? I'm guessing because if this is flat, in the limit of flat, if this is completely flat, all density of states are concentrated on this energy. It's much larger density of states. So slower curvature makes it larger density, more states for a given, I don't know, interval of energy. More states for a given window of energy for blue than red. Okay? So this is why total this is why total, total density of states is given by sum of the light hole band, heavy hole density of states and light hole density of states. Heavy hole density of states and light hole density of states. And then, if you just erase all the unnecessary thing, square root of two, Just, just erase all the things that you can erase. You get something heavy hole, uh, hole density of states, three half equals to m heavy hole density of states, three half plus light hole, density of states, three half. So, M, H, star, becomes M, H, H, star, three half, plus M, L, H, star, three half. Something like that. So here's a here's a here's a here's a uh, whole the whole mass effective effective mass of the whole. And you know how to find heavy hole density. St sorry, you know how to find heavy hole mass and light hole mass independently, just a curvature. Okay, so once you know heavy hole and light hole mass, you can figure out the, the effective mass for, for the hole. Finally, I'm going to conclude this series of lecture by just going back to LED or diode. So we make PN junction. PN junction. PN. 
junction diode. And then to make this junction, we put energy gram diagram, which looks like this. Here is so-called depletion region. Dep depletion region, no carriers, but I said, oh, by the way, this is, this is EC, right? This is EV. But I said there are carriers here. And I said there are holes. Okay? I mean don't draw don't write electron and holes yet. Okay, I'm going to erase those. Okay? This was a picture I wrote in the first lecture. But now you know that electron doesn't sit all in an equal basis, equal level. Now you know that actually electron distribute themselves with a concentration distribution which looks like this. Right? Now you know. Right? Electron distribution is like this. N. Right? And then we have a little bit of the hole here. And we have more holes here. We have more holes here. Like this. And small amount of electron here. Right? So we put forward bias. Uh, uh, sorry, um, even though for the, for the sake of argument, I, I will actually make it a little bit smaller. You, you, you'll find out why, but you know, just, just, Okay, now I'm going to put battery, put battery, and forward bias the whole thing. Forward bias. Forward bias means I'm going to reduce the difference. I'm going to bring this down. Then how does the, the number of electrons that can go from right to left change. I'm just going to reduce the height of the barrier from the point of view of the electron. I'm just, you know, one volt, 0 .0, 0 0.01 volts, 0 0.02 volts, 0 0.03 volts, and so on. Eventually, if I put one volt for the case of silicon, they just go flat, okay? So, I'm going to apply forward bias, bias, this is forward, this is back, this is reverse, reverse bias, and if you put forward bias, it goes like this. Basically, the the current increases exponentially. 
why is current why does current increase exponentially well, that's only because of this exponential shape you reduce the barrier so the number of the, the electron that can go to right, from right to left increases exponentially is it clear so because of this exponential distribution of electron you reduce the barrier you get more and more electron that has energy larger than the barrier and this number of electron that can go right to left increases exponentially as we reduce the barrier so now you know why if you forward bias diode this goes exponentially there's also slight small current that flows on a reverse, reverse bias that does not depend on the bias reverse bias means reverse bias means we will actually move this even farther right make it even farther but you know we get some current constant current regardless of how much reverse bias we apply and that's due to that's due to minority carry so let's just look at this hole let's just look at this hole this hole these holes you know, just randomly moves because of the thermal energy if this hole reaches this part, part remember the whole energy is higher in this way so this is like a cliff so by mistake if hole reaches here they, ran, they go down the slope to the other side same is true for this electron or you know there's a there's little bit of electron right so there's a little bit of electron if some of the electron comes came here by mistake by diffusion you know it has to go down immediately to reach the other end so that's the source of the current so it's all statistic it's just a num number of electron or holes reaching this cliff edge by mistake and that they flow as a reverse bias constant reverse bias and how much constant reverse bias it flows depends on the mobility right and also effective mass how much I not we get it depends on the mobility and an effective mass nowadays uh, people are trying to develop electro electric vehicle right car without gasoline uh, already probably 80 percent of the effort of developing cars are put into electronics because you know mechanical part is somewhat of course you know already developed of course they, they want to make them light so that and mechanically strong so that you know they can reduce the weight the total weight of the car to to save energy but at the same time they need they need semiconductors that work stably or you know cons uh, norm that, that works in a high temperature high temperature environment such as in inside you know close to or inside the engine compartment of the car right 
silicon has energy gap of only 1.1 electron volts. But people are trying to use semiconductor with much larger um, band gap so that one can use that as a, as a, as a for, for the, for the, for the uh, you know, high temperature application. I've already, I showed you today that high temperature, everything become intrinsic semiconductors. But that depends on the band gap. Bigger band gap means, you know, less probable that they become intrinsic. So that's, uh, that's another thing that, uh, you know, people are trying to do right now. Um, and of course we learned silicon doesn't emit light, even though we do this, but uh, gallium-arsenide does because it's, a, because it's a direct semiconductor, right? We also learned that, I also told you that this is a, this is a, this is a, for example, this is for example, um, um, solar cell. Performance of the solar cell, of course, depends on once they, you create a carrier, how quickly they, they separate and they move and they reach the electrodes. That depends on the conductivity. And conductivity depends on the effective mass and also um, you know, mobility as well. But mobility, of course, also depends on the effective mass. So this is why we needed to learn about the, uh, learn about the uh, energy diagram. Um, if we talk about transistors, if we talk about transistors, N, P, N. You know, we have something like that. Or any transistors. You do switch on and off, right, with the transistors. In a, in a, in a, in a, in a, quant, in a quant computer, in a computer, Intel, whatever megahertz, is fast because it can switch on and off the current very rapidly. How do we switch on and off so quickly? Okay? Bias on, bias off. That's all. But I told you that sometimes, okay, when I when I when I just when I talk about transistor, I only talk about electron going here and reaching this point. Right? Well, reaching not this point, but mainly going through here. Yeah. But there's another sort of killer in this application, which is a minority carrier. Even though in the, in the n-type, there's always holes. Here, there's always holes. And they can flow. Right? So when you switch on and off, you want to kill these minority carrier as soon as possible. Some, for this application, not anymore, but the big invention about 30 years ago was to introduce deep level so that you can kill all the minority carriers quickly through deep levels, send them back to balance band and so on. So I guess this is just the beginning because we're back to the starting point, unfortunately. <laughs> With all these, you know, 12 weeks of lectures, we come back to the same point. So it is somewhat unfortunate, but you just have to move on with this. Okay? So I guess we uh, stop this.